Chapter 3 The Lost Madeline With the sound of the doorbell, there was chaos and panic in the hearts of the members of the house. Nobody was expecting a guest so early in the morning. The situation could not get any worse for Elisa. Victoria kept on knocking the door. With each knock Elisa remembered what she said in Wistar. She's the wrong girl. Victoria was there for Suzanne. Elisa went to her older sister and took her hand and pushed her behind herself. The only defense she could use in front of Victoria was herself. One more thing added up to the things Jim was not fully aware which made him nervous to his bones. He went to the door to open it, but Alfred prevented him to do so. That's the bear your daughter told you about. Stay back, Alfred said to Jim. Harper took out his swords, and Alfred put an arrow in his bow and aimed the door. She's here for Suzanne. What do we do? Alyssa went straight to Harper and Alfred. Everyone heard what she said. Suzanne panicked and hid behind her father like a little puppy. Alyssa. Harper and Alfred intended to kill her, as they had killed her before, but neither of them knew that the power of her magic was incomparable, because Wistar was the James land, and no witch could win over him. Harper ran to James from the door on the roof for his help, and others stayed in living room until H. He arrived, the sound of leaves rustling, wood eaten by termites, Victoria's small laughs, Suzanne's deep breaths, and a dagger which was being sharped by Alyssa, could be heard. They waited for her attack. That was their smart plan. All of them stayed together with their eyes on the door. After a few moments they started to sneeze. Air inside the house was full of dust, and the front wall of the house was completely destroyed. A flood of black spiders invaded the house. It was easy to deal with them, but the more they killed them the more they became. Spider's attack was a brilliant idea of Victoria, to distract everyone while she aimed for Suzanne. How are their numbers increasing? There are so many of them, Alyssa asked Alfred as she was cutting one spider's guts with a dagger. They are coming from me our beloved and promised victim. Amazing fighting skills you have, I assume you got it from your father. Victoria talked to Elisa as she had her arm around Suzanne's neck, with her black wings all over her body, which reminded Elisa of what happened to herself in Wistar. She could not let that wicked witch harm her sister. Everyone in that room was ready to risk their lives, free her, or you'll lose your wings. Elisa threatened her, but it came to be funny to Victoria. Has anyone ever told you that the only thing you do is brag? You did not get that from your father. You were so hollow, little girl. Victoria mocked Alyssa. Suzanne was stuck in her wings, begging her father to save her. But the only thing he did was to stand there and watch Victoria with an empty mind. Memory flashbacks came to his head, but in a blur shape. He heard a buzz in his head and collapsed to the ground. So did Alfred and everyone else in the house. Victoria was the last one standing, proud of herself that she completed the task King Madak had assigned to her. She put a spell on the house and transferred it to Remora. Realm of Madak, without entering Wistar, welcome to Remora, House of Madak, one of the five realms, Victoria said, while she was looking at Jim with a crooked smile. She went straight to him and whispered something in his ear. I kept my promise, Your Grace. Jim tried his best to hide his emotions, which he succeeded. But his family were suspicious of his actions. Dad, why aren't you doing anything? She's right in front of you. Cut her throat. Alyssa yelled at her father. But Jim only gave her a heavy-hearted look. If only she had a sword. She would have killed Victoria already. Alfred was sick of the situation and could not bear it any more. So, he lifted up his sword and aimed for her. Everyone was waiting to see Victoria's death, but Jim stopped Alfred. He blocked the sword by his hand. Suzanne's scream filled the house. Alfred looked at Jim with startled eyes. 
Victoria rushed to bandage Jim's hand. Alfred could only ask one thing why. She's not our enemy. No need for that. Jim tried to calm Alfred's anger, but Alfred could not believe he defended the evil witch. She rubbed you from your home, your peace. She tried to kill Elisa, and now she's after your other daughter, and still you defend her, Alfred. Said. Alyssa agreed with Alfred. Both of them were against Jim's choices, but none of them knew the whole story, both of you. Do not make any difficulties while we stay in Remora. Now we must meet with the king. After that I shall give you the truth. Jim tried to silence them before anyone heard their conversation. Why would we do as it pleases you? For the two centuries that I've been trapped in Wistar, I knew one thing. To not ever set my foot in this realm, Madoc will not hesitate for killing us, Alfred said to Jim. Who told you this nonsense? Jim asked Alfred. Who do you think? James saved me and kept me alive for two centuries. He was one of the finest elder men of Remora. Alfred answered Jim. You do not matter to him. He only used Elisa to open the last gate to begin his plan. And about you, Victoria is the reason you still breath young man. Jim said, I want all of you to obey what you are told and not to make a scene. That's the end of this conversation. Jim ordered everyone in a way that none of them dared to disobey. He stared at Alyssa, and Alfred all he could, with his heart torn apart and the smile made of sorrow, wishing they knew that they are from his blood. The young man standing in front of him was his son. He had to fight with all of his being shouting to hug his only son. But he could not reveal that secret for Alfred's safety. Remora was his enemy. One giant golden carriage with four white horses arrived to their destroyed house. It was from King Madoc XI to accompany the Laurent family to the palace. Victoria ordered one of the soldiers to open the door. And then everyone got on the golden carriage. On the way to the palace, awkward silence reigned in the carriage. No one wanted the road to end. No one wanted to know what was about to happen. No one trusted anyone else to ask a question, only Jim to his little girl. But the feeling wasn't mutual. Elisa did not know who to believe any more. Jim lost the unconditional love and trust from her. Luna Jim's wife was the only person who was eager to arrive to the palace and meet her king. She was originally from Remora, the daughter of one of King's guards. The second they set foot in Remora, she remembered all her past memories like a moth to flame. Luna and Suzanne were sitting and chatting happily on the right side of the carriage. Victoria was silent in the middle and Elisa and Alfred were on the left side in front of Jim. Jim, who had his eyes closed, was hoping that his children would let him have his last peaceful moment. Elisa watched the road from carriage's window to memorize it for time of need. Do not bother yourself, little girl. We are passing from the king's road to the palace. Without this carriage, it would be invisible to your eyes. Victoria whispered into Alyssa's right ear, which gave her goosebumps, and she distanced herself from her. You do not need to make conversation with me. I cannot tolerate your existence and nothing could ever change my feelings towards you. Alyssa's heart was filled with hatred and vengeance towards her. She tried to convince herself that her father was under Victoria's spell, but he was not. Tell them what is needed for them to know. You are round more than me, Jim said to Victoria with his eyes closed. Alfred objected him and wanted to hear everything from him. I am stuck here because of you, and yet you do not bother yourself to give me a simple explanation. Alfred accused Jim for his misery. I am stuck in my enemy's land, because of both of you. You do not get to threaten me with your judgmental eyes. Do as I say, and we all get to escape to our realm. Jim lowered his voice, so that only the three of them could hear. Victoria could not hide her happiness for this family reunion, and showed it with a little smile on her lips. On the other hand, 
Alfred and Alyssa were more confused than ever by their father's voice. Our realm. Where's our realm? Alyssa changed her seat and went to sit beside her father and asked her question, which caught everyone's eyes. It's called Riverland. Your father is under a spell that prevents him from talking about secrets buried in his heart. That's why he ordered me to tell you what you were supposed to know. Victoria answered instead of Jim. Her words were true, by order of King Maddock XI. His memories of his past life in Riverland had been wiped, and only by his order and Victoria's spell he could have them back. But Luna, who used to be Remora's citizen, got her memories back. The second she entered Remora, Jim wished this rule could have included him. He wished he had never met his son in Wistar, so he would never know who he was until he entered his realm, so he wouldn't have to bear a heavy pain and agony in his heart. Wishing he could only hold him in his arm again, her two hundred years of being apart, that he could tell him this is his sister that he could not meet. When she was born, but he held it all back. If only Maddock had heard that Alfred was Jim's son. If Maddock had even known his real name, he would have beheaded him right away. And then he would have had Jim's head cut. For not being loyal to him, when the time comes, you to have to run. Do not think about anyone else, just run, Jim told Elisa and Alfred, where? Let me make it clear, Dad. We are in another land, in one of King's carriages on a road. That's only visible to the ones in this damn carriage. We are screwed. Elisa whispered quietly and Alfred agreed. There's a forest behind the palace. Go there and run north. After one hour on the run, you'll reach a giant stone in shape of a snake, which is on the edge of a small lake. You must pour the water on the stone and say the words written on it. Then the gate to Wistar will open. And you'll reach Wistar. Jim explained the plan to his children very considerately and calm. But chaos ruled his heart. To spare his children for the second time was the hardest thing a father could do. When you meet James, tell him to follow King Jamie's order and he would take you to Riverland's gate, Victoria. Completed Jim's sentence and Jim approved her by nodding. While Suzanne and Luna were so busy looking outside and enjoying the fresh air of Remora, Alfred and Alyssa felt like they were imprisoned in an invisible cage and could not find a way out. After a long stressful journey, the carriage stopped, one of the footmen opened the door, and everyone got off the carriage. They had arrived to the palace garden. Seven people came to the carriage to welcome them. Four guards and two maids and the king's hand, who was called Sir Sally. He went closer to Jim and bent his knee on the ground, a gesture of respect. Welcome back, my lord. The court had never felt more vulnerable in history. With the absence of the commander of King's Guards, Sir Sally said, while he was still on his knees, Jim was named the commander of King's Guards in the short time he stayed in Remora. We must haste, my lord. King Maddock is very eager to see you and your family, Sir Sally said. But I was informed that we would welcome Lord Laurent, his daughter and his lovely wife Lady Laurent. Yet I see we have to unexpected guests, he continued. Give us your name and title, and we shall give you ours. Alfred said to Sir Sally, It is Sir Sally, hand of the king and master of throne young man. Sir Sally said. Jim was so worried that his impulsive children might do a stupid thing or say their true name, that he pressed his nails so hard that his wound opened. Victoria as a loyal witch to him intervened in the case and introduced Elisa as Jim's younger daughter and Alfred as her friend from Earth, who is called Jake. Sir Sally led the way to the palace and everyone else followed him. Elisa and Alfred chose to be the last and Victoria walked behind them for their own good. There was a road that led to the palace and all that's left was covered with white roses. Enormous rose bushes. It was all they could see. The flower bushes were so tall that they blocked the sunlight. And the road leading to the palace was completely shaded. 
everyone thought that the king ordered to plant these bushes to beautify the yard of his palace, except the one who added magic to the lives. Of roses, Victoria, the beautiful rose garden was a way to defend the palace. King Madoc XI ordered the Great Witch to put a spell on the roses that if the enemy from any land came close to the palace, would die out of their poison. Memorize this road and look for the forest your father told us about, Alfred whispered in. Alyssa's ears. Alyssa was very careful and memorized every step she took, but she started to feel dizzy. She felt that she was drugged by the scent of the roses, but it was King Maddox's plan to secure his castle. This happened not only to her, Alfred also suffered. Victoria noticed their terrible condition. And again she saved those who she promised she would. It is the defense of the palace. Anyone who is not from Remora shall choke to death before reaching the castle. Victoria's words brought fear and anxiety to Elisa and Alfred, and then she gave each of them to small green pills, which were like peas. It was the cure for the toxin in the air. Take one of them before anyone notices your illness, or you shall lose your heads. Before the toxic air kill you, Victoria tried to talk some scenes to the two confused persons in front of her. Alfred took one of the pills and chewed it, and put one of them inside Alyssa's mouth by force which brought Victoria to laugh and Alyssa to nag, and that caught everyone's attention. The cure worked immediately, after that Victoria gained their trust a little bit more, after a long and boring walk. They arrived to the castle's building. There was a giant door ahead of them. Everyone stopped to receive orders. So Sally informed Victoria that it would be a better choice, that they change into decent clothes to meet the High King. The giant door opened. Everyone was expecting the room to be filled with people but only a few servants were waiting for them to show them the dressing rooms. The king had prepared a magnificent party in the court, which was placed in the center of palace. All the high lords of Remora were waiting for Jim's return. They were headed in a long corridor, which was shaped like a maze. There were small doors in the corridor, which led to another corridor. Sir Sally did not rest his lips the whole way to their rooms. He kept talking about all the paintings on the walls, which were late kings Madoc and their queens. This is your chamber, my lord. Maids will provide your needs. So Sally said to Jim. Everyone could see the rooms through the door from where they were standing. One room was prepared for Lady Luna, one for Suzanne, and one for Lord Laurent. The two unexpected guests were left out of fancy rooms for guests but they received one beautiful room that was owned by the late Princess Madeline. Unlike the tiny dusty door, the room was a delight. Ancient facilities and antiques were arranged. For instance, one table in the middle with four chairs around it. Two beds besides the windows that opened to the garden and mirrors were everywhere. Even on the ceiling, it was said and believed that Princess Madeline could see the truth that was buried under in them. The truth that had been forgotten, the truth that were lost. Nobody had seen her since she ran to her room screaming and locked the door. Some would say that King Madoc XI had killed her precious daughter because the little girl knew how cruel her father was. She saw him as who he really was. King Madoc XI was a cruel king indeed, but cruelty is not what makes a true king. All the five realms only knew one true king, King Jamie of Riverland. Even though he ruled over Riverland, one of the five realms, he was indeed known as the King in. All five realms. Everyone was so busy with bathing and changing into their clothes. But Alyssa took the longest to get ready because of all the blood and wounds on her body. The masters went into her room to cure her wounds and Alfred stayed by her side. In that time Suzanne and Luna were in the corridor busy and happy talking about where to go and what to do after they meet the king. Little they knew that King Madoc XI had been planning Suzanne's death, Remora's old church. 
and Jim and Victoria were providing swords and daggers for Alyssa, and Alfred's escape. After the masters left Alyssa's room, she started to wear the heavy silk dress. She went behind the giant room separating apparatus. Alfred went over to the screen and looked at the pretty girl, who was half-dressed, not knowing she was her sister. Hey, was something light under your dress. We have to run after we meet their king, remember? Alfred told her. While he was handing over trousers, you kidding me? I cannot even walk, and you expect me to run? In these. Alyssa answered him in a miserable funny way, which brought a little smile on Alfred's lips. Alyssa put on a jacket and the trousers under her robe. They left the room and joined Alyssa's family. Seeing her mother and Suzanne got her thinking. Why hasn't her mother even said a word to her? The whole time they arrived, it was time to meet King Maddock XI, a king whose reputation for cruelty was exemplary in all Remora. All eyes were on them, their whispers running through the toxic air. Their gaze could cut through their skin. As the Laurent family walked to King Maddock XI among the crowd in the palace, they were watched and judged by the High Lords of Remora that were present at the court that day, the 14th of August. There was only one soul present who knew the past events, without any distortion, who was aware of all the lies and betrayals that soaked behind their robes. The lost princess Madeline, who was watching her beloved realm from above them all. To bad that this world was so cruel for this young princess, and she could not fit in it. King Madak XI was sitting on his throne. A big woolen chair that was designed with little snakes made of gold. He was no small man, but was drowning in golden snakes. He rose from his throne with pain, and frown appeared between his eyebrows. The air in Remora has never been so pleasant. Welcome home, Sir Jim. King Madak XI, as he opened his arms to Sir Jim. But Sir Jim knelt down before King Madak XI, and showed his respect to him. King Madak XI rushed to him, and Sir Jim rose. And they both hugged like to lost brothers. The court was filled with applause. And cheer in that moment. There was only a single soul who did not have glee on her face. No matter how hard she tried to make herself believe that the man standing in front of him was her father. She failed. Suzanne, on the other hand, was finally getting what she has always dreamed of. Living like a princess. No matter how this land affected her sister or her father, she did not care, Sir Sally. Let all Remora know, on the occasion of Sir Jim's arrival in Remora, the whole realm will celebrate, donate gold to each family from the court treasury. King Madak XI ordered his hand. Sir Sally obeyed his king, but he suggested him to great other guests as well. When Sir Jim heard of what he said, he could only hope that his children would not say what they weren't supposed to. This is Miss. Suzanne, Sir Jim's daughter. Sir Sally introduced Suzanne to King Madak XI. Suzanne bowed to him while shaking like a wet cat under a winter rain. King Madak's eyes shined like to brown diamonds as he heard about Suzanne. He went closer to her and took her hands. Suzanne looked like a real princess in her lavender silk. Dress. With her long hair covering her shoulders, King Madak XI could not hide his excitement and showed more interest in her than he did for meeting Sir Jim. We all have been waiting for you more than a decade, my child, King Madak XI said to Suzanne by his expressive voice. Suzanne could not help but to feel more frightened by the majesty and power of the king as he talked to her than she was a few seconds ago. If I had known about it, I would have come to Remora sooner, Your Grace. Forgive me. I was not informed. Suzanne stuttered, but she continued to answer to King Madak XI as best as she could. Her fear and her trembling voice brought laughter and delight to the court. She was loved from the very beginning. You are just in time. King Madak XI comforted Suzanne's heart by his answer. But he could not help to wonder if Sir Jim told his family about the task 
that they were assigned to do. Enlighten me, Sir Jim. Have you not spilled a word to your family? King Madoc Eleventh asked Sir Jim, I must intervene in this matter. Sir Jim had the great witch to cast a spell on him. Your Grace, Sir Sally answered the question in behalf of Sir Jim. King Madoc Eleventh never fancied Victoria. To him she was a prisoner that he used until she lost her value. What of a rubbish spell have you casted on him? King Madoc Eleventh blamed Victoria. He yelled at her so loud that his saliva particles danced in the air. Spell for silence, your grace. It was Sir Jim's idea. In order to keep the remorse prophecy safe, he ordered me to cast a spell on him that he wouldn't say a word to any soul. Victoria answered King Madoc Eleventh with a frightened voice. Her skin was paler than always. The great witch of all realms was afraid of Madoc Eleventh. Undo the spall now, or I shall have your wings cut. King Madoc Eleventh threatened Victoria by cruelty. The poor witch was stuck in a land without any of her keen, and forced to serve kings of Remora for two centuries. After King Madoc Eleventh threatened Victoria, she immediately went to Sir Jim and grabbed his hands. She closed her eyes and started to hum words in a language born in Remora. Could understand. King Madoc Eleventh stared at Victoria carefully while she was undoing the spell. He was waiting patiently for her to make a mistake to have the pleasure of cutting a witch's wings. The spell was undone and Victoria was ordered to leave the courts by King Madoc. She flew to the palace yard through the people and surprised all the lords at the court, King Madoc eleventh size court Alyssa and Alfred. He went closer to them and Sir Sally followed his company. This is Miss Alyssa, Sir Jim's younger daughter, and this young man is called Jake, I assume. Sir Sally introduced Alyssa and Alfred to King Madoc eleventh. They both bowed to him and showed their respect. A as soon as Sir Sally introduced Alyssa as Sir Jim's younger daughter, the whispers started only one daughter was all that could be heard. One voice from the crowd shouted, Who is the one we were promised? Which caused a massive chaos at the court. Although he was arrested and hanged by the king's guards after that incident. How many years have you lived, child? King Madoc Eleventh asked Alyssa. Eighteen. Your Grace, Alyssa answered. Unlike Suzanne, she was steady as a rock that made her father proud. But King Madoc Eleventh felt unsafe around the little girl. That situation forced Sir Jim to intervene. She opened the gate, Your Grace. Sir Jim brought delight and brightness into King Madoc Eleventh's eyes. He shook Alyssa's wounded hand and welcomed her. Until then Alyssa thought that she was the wrong girl that she was not who Victoria was after, but she knew something for certain that it was her blood. That opened the gate. What of this young man Sir Jim? King Madoc Eleventh asked Sir Jim. King Madoc Eleventh's voice caused Sir Jim to feel like his head was full of ants, and they were eating his brain. The idea of Madoc recognising his son was so worrisome, but he managed to pull himself together. To make the answer short, He's Alyssa's friend from Earth. He must have noticed Victoria attacking our house, and he came to our rescue. When Victoria casted the spell he was right next to me. In our house. That's how he ended up here. Sir Jim answered King Madoc Eleventh. Yes, your grace, and if it's not too much to ask. I'd like to be sent home. Alfred seized the opportunity and took a shot in the dark. Water under the bridge boy. King Madoc Eleventh said to Alfred. He patted his shoulder and went to his throne and sank in it once again. We are proud to welcome our guests. They will stay in Remora for eternity. King Madoc Eleventh placed his order. It was not an invitation. It was a death sentence for Jim's family. And only two souls knew about that, Sir Jim and the Great Witch. Victoria, with Sir Sally's gesture, the main door of the castle opened, and everyone present left the court to the royal dining hall. It was by the king's order 
to serve all the lords a fancy meal to celebrate Sir Jim's return. At the luncheon that day, Queen Talia and Crown Prince Madoc XII also joined King Madoc XI at the table. Queen Talia was known for her beauty in all remora. Pale skin with blue eyes and the sharp nose with red lips, all of them combined had made her the symbol of beauty in remora. The Crown Prince got his looks from her mother and his manners from his father. He was the true example of a true prince, an excellent swordsman, a fair judge, an ambitious man with great physical strength. He was only sixteen by that time, but he had achieved more than any lord. In Remora would do in their lifetimes. At the royal dining palace, the atmosphere was freezing cold due to the high stone walls, and all the food was cold. The duck meat was hard as a rock, and no matter how hard Elisa tried, she could not swallow it. The meat was like a ball in the corner of her mouth. King Madoc XI, who had very sharp eyes, noticed that Elisa's cheek was swollen, and he asked if she had any illness. Or anything bothered her, after his question. Everyone stopped eating and all eyes were focused on her. It was something none of them had seen. Before, King Madoc XI was showing interest in another human being. Alyssa, who was frightened by his attention, could not come up with an excuse. And she spilled the truth immediately, I beg your pardon. It's the duck, your grace, with Alyssa's confession. King Madek Eleventh Eyes became red out of rage, but she finally could take out the ball of meat in secret and put it in a napkin. He gave order to his guard to bring the royal cook to his side. The poor man came to the king with haste and was out of breath. King Madek Eleventh told Alyssa that she should be the one who punishes the guilty. She hated the attention he was paying towards her. So regardless of anyone, she chose an apology as his punishment. The royal could not be more thankful for her decision, and he apologised to Alyssa. The matter was getting closed, but Prince Madoc XII could not stay silent when the matter of punishment was being discussed. I assume you are not completely familiar with how we rule here. Prince Madoc XII said to Alyssa as he abandoned his chair, and went closer to her. Everyone present around the table was sure that the royal cook was taking his last breaths. Prince Madoc XII grabbed Alyssa's hand and took her napkin from her, and offered it to the royal cook. They all looked at his movements dumbfounded. Perfect punishment for your blunder. Prince Madoc XII ordered him to eat the meat in the napkin. Everyone found it disgusting except King Madoc XI, who was drinking his wine at peace. Being proud of his son, the poor royal cook ate the chewed meat. Nobody dared to look because of the fear of the prince. After his punishment, he quickly left the prince's presence. Prince Madoc XII sat down on his chair and continued to eat his meal. Like nothing had happened, Elisa could not help but to feel sorry for that poor man. But there was nothing she could do, except to give a furious look to Prince Madoc XII. And of course the prince did not lack in that war of looks. He gave her a big grin with his perfect face. But Elisa only stared at him with hatred. Dot the awful lunch was finally over. For Suzanne and Luna, it was the loveliest meal. They had ever eaten despite the horrible punishment Prince Madoc XII did to the royal cook. But that one hour of time lasted a year for Sir Jim and his other two children. Soon each guest was surrounded by two servants. To show the way to the fitted rooms, each of them got separate rooms which were filled with candles for the light, and antiques to give a good view to the room. Alyssa and Alfred started to look for anything sharp so that they could use to defend themselves. As soon as the servants left their rooms, but the only sharp thing they could find was jewellery used to decorate hair, Alyssa could not sit around and do nothing. She checked the height of the window, but it was too high to jump, sick of the air in her room. She sicked into the hallway to find anything, and tiptoed like a wolf, so that her feet wouldn't make noise. Suddenly she got pulled into a room with a hand on her mouth. Someone's been watching her that whole time.